A man wakes in a hospital to find the world changed. The hospital is abandoned. No doctors or nurses are around to help him. Outside, the world has fallen into silent chaos. The few remaining humans are fighting for their lives against monsters that are out for blood. Think you know what we're talking about? Think again. Today, we are joined by pseudopods Alex and Alistair to discuss the Day of the Triffids. And as always, this is the No Fear Cast. We know what scares you. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm Mel. I'm Lisa, and this is the No Fear Podcast, and we're here with Alistair and Alex from Pseudopod. And today I am so excited that we are talking about The Day of the Triffids, the 1951 novel by John Wyndham. And I don't know when you will be listening to this, but we are recording this right before Father's Day. And it's very exciting to me because uh, this was a movie that was introduced to me by my father. So it was one of our favorites, and I'm excited to be talking about it. But in case you don't know what a triffid is, why don't we start out by talking a little bit about what the what the story is about? All right, Lisa, let me just run through a brief summary of the book itself, since uh, there may be people out there who have not read it, or maybe they're familiar with the movie and not the book, or vice versa. Basically, it's a it's an apocalypse, post apocalypse novel. You have a protagonist named Bill Mason, who's a biologist who has basically spent his career working with triffids, studying them. And triffids are are kind of like Venus flytraps, but way bigger. They have whips with poison on the end of them, and they can walk around. And the origin of triffids is unclear, though most people seem to believe, as we've talked about in a previous episode of this podcast, that they were manipulated somehow or created somehow in the East, in Russia. But people grab onto these triffids because their triffid oil is a great replacement for fossil fuels. And so they become part of the economy, basically. And you have triffid farms everywhere. People uh, don't seem to really worry about the fact that the triffids can move around and poison people because they can dock them, take the poison piece of the plant off, and they can kind of chain them down or put them on farms. But when Bill Mason spends a, a few days in the hospital because he was blinded by a triffid sting, a meteor shower happens that everybody's excited about, and it blinds everybody. And so when Mason wakes up on the day he's supposed to get his bandages off, it's just complete chaos. Because if people are blinded and the triffids escape, then you not only have to worry about a world where people can't see, but you also have to worry about people who can't see these monstrous carnivorous plants coming after them. And from then on, it becomes Bill Bill's kind of adventure in trying to survive the situation with different people trying to come up with different ways to survive or recreate society. And he meets Josella along the way, and they kind of become the, the main characters that try to survive the situation. Yeah, it's very much a... Um... What we, what we would consider now a, an apocalyptic narrative, watching the world kind of burn. And it's something that we're familiar with today. But in, in many ways, Wyndham's book was kind of the first of its kind. And he is, he's an English author. And so that's part of the reason that we wanted to have Alistair on here today, because he's going to be our token Brit. Um, <laughs> but Alistair, what is it that what, what is it that uh, connects you to the story? A couple of different things. This and one of Wyndham's other science fiction novels, The Croc and Wakes, were two of the earliest kind of adult-themed books I could remember reading. And also, there was an early 1980s TV adaptation of this, which, just to kind of really briefly give you some kind of context for it, the, the BBC for about 20 years had had this very specific view of genre fiction, which was if it wasn't Doctor Who, you did it once a decade. And this was that particular decade's designated work. And for reasons I've still not quite been able to understand, I got shown this at school. We, we didn't have a, an assignment on it, I can remember. We didn't study it. It's just for, for three lessons, the English teacher, who at this point, wasn't my dad because my dad did also work at the same school basically went watch this 
and sat us in front of this kind of six half hour episodes of people being terribly British in 1980s and being attacked by colossal killer daffodils. And the pretty much the entirety of the rest of my class were like, what the hell? And I was like, more. So this is very much kind of one of the cornerstones of genre fiction for me. And this and Croc and Wakes have always been sort of two books which register quite strongly on my radar in comparison with pretty much everything else. Yeah, we should probably go ahead and point out that John Wyndham, and Mel, you were talking about this earlier, he was an extensive writer, but he also wrote uh, The Midwitch Cuckoos, which was later adapted into several adaptations um, under the name The Village of the Damned. So many of our listeners will probably recognize that. But Wyndham was definitely somebody who was influential um, in his time. One thing that I found really interesting as I was reading this, I went back and I, I was introduced to the 1962 film, which at some point bears no resemblance to Wyndham's story at all. And I'd be interested to see <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the later adaptations of it, because I know there was that one in the 80s that you were referring to, Alistair. But then there was also, I think, one in like 2009. Yes. Um, it- Right. Eddie Izzard and Jason Priestley. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and Eddie Izzard was in that one too, wasn't he? That's right. <laughs> but yeah, he, he was kind of a cornerstone uh, for for science fiction of the time because when we talk about, especially the opening of the book and, and what opens a lot of the movie versions, it's very familiar to audiences today of a man wakes up in a hospital, nobody's around, walks outside to a world in chaos where now monsters are trying to defeat civilization. And, you know, that's become almost trite today. But I don't know. I think, I think we might be able to say he was the first to really do that. He's definitely on, on the early end for, for doing that. There, there are a handful of, of earlier versions. I know we're looking at some of these for something for pseudopod next year, but definitely the, from the visual standpoint, I would say that this film, I mean, you, it's really easy to, to draw direct lines between 28 days later and the walking dead and some of the visuals of the openings of those, like you can, you can point to walking across the Windsor bridge, the shot from the 1963 day of the Triffids is straight up the same shot from 28 Days Later. Well, and uh, Mel, you were telling me earlier that the director of uh, 28 Days Later actually said that he pulled that from Day of the Triffids. Yeah, yeah. He and the writer, which when the when we were talking before the recording of this, Matt, you said you noticed uh, that was one of the things that popped out to you when you're reading the book. And then I said, oh, I saw in, in an, a review, movie review, that there was that connection, mainly the opening hospital sequence, but also that idea of just, yeah, a world in chaos, the emptiness of some places. Definitely there's that connection between the two. I even noticed with the the ending of the book, at least, where there's this sort of push and pull between the military autocracy that's trying to be established versus this more free democratic society that, of course, our heroes end up choosing. I mean, that that is very much the second half of 28 Days Later right there, where you've got the army captain versus trying to kidnap the women for breeding purposes, essentially very in line with the end of the book. So I I was reading, I finished the book last night and I was sitting there in my living room going, 28 days later, got so much from this. I didn't (laughs) even know. (laughs) Wyndham does some really interesting things, I think. Um, And and Alex, I think you're right in saying that he was one of the earliest ones to do this, if, if not the earliest. But he does a lot with the idea of keeping civilization intact and what kind of what makes you human in the face of survival. There, there is a point in the book which I found almost sweet and innocent in a way when the main character was walking around and he's hungry. And this is fairly early in the book. And he sees some food in a store and thinks, well, I could just break a window and take it. But then he worries about how he's going to pay for it. And there's this kind of push and pull that I think we take for granted as viewers today when we see an apocalyptic narrative, but that he really explores of 
if I let go of my humanity or if I let go of these rules of civilization, then what do I have? He doesn't want to turn to looting and stealing and he doesn't want to, you know, later in the book, he worries about it being turned into some sort of feudal society that I think, I think was pretty unique at the time. Yeah. And there's, there's a really interesting thing which leapt out of me when, when I reread it about that, which is Bill's kind of a dick. This isn't apparent even in, in the TV show and in, in that he's this kind of quite earnest, very sensible kind of solid guy. But the amount of the book that he spends going, so you, you, you wrote a sexy novel. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> really? Yes. You know, um, I, I, I just I, I got to the halfway point and I was like, oh, my God, he's my gr- he's everyone's slightly sexist uncle who has somehow survived the apocalypse. And it, it, it's really interesting, especially looking at it from this perspective and, and from the fact that we're kind of two or three adaptations deep where Bill hasn't this incarnation of Bill hasn't aged well at all. And it's, uh, I find it really interesting that he's what tends to get changed the most. And you can see why. Because he, Wyndham takes what you mentioned, the kind of, oh, I should take some food. But, what are, but how will I pay for it? That kind of fundamental British, gosh, I, I'm feeling a thing. I'm confused and worried. I'll just pretend it hasn't happened and move on. Thing, And, and just kind of makes an entire character out of it. And the way that he unfolds very gradually across the book almost maps onto the changes that were just starting to hit society. At that. Yeah, I, I noticed that there was a really interesting gender politics at play, especially with Josella, because she did write a book called, I think, Sex is My Adventure, if that yes. tells you uh, anything about it. And she spent a good portion of the book apologizing and saying that she didn't want to be known for something that she did back in a society that doesn't exist anymore because people want to point that out. Bill especially (laughs) wants to point that out that she wrote this thing. And um, I I found that a bit shocking. Absolutely. Yeah, kind of in the same way that I thought Bill did not panic nearly enough (laughs) in in the face of certain (laughs) things. Um, (laughs) uh, You know, from the very beginning, if I saw a plant uproot itself and start walking around that would not be okay with me on on any level (laughs) and everybody seems to take it as uh well this is happening now and (laughs) they're doing this thing and they're maybe talking to each other and oh they're probably sentient beings but that's okay um you know I even almost missed the part where there was an epidemic going on and people were dying of a disease because Bill just kind of watches it and says, you know, yes, they, they're dying now. People are dead here. Let's move on. <laughs> and I, I found that a little and maybe that's my contemporary glasses that I'm reading this through, you know, having seen things like 28 Days Later or The Walking Dead. But, yeah, Bill, Bill is a interesting character. <laughs> <laughs> He, he was definitely matter of fact about the plague and, oh, so this is how, well, and, and even before that, when he's kidnapped and forced to lead a group of blind people, it's like, oh, well, so this is happening. Okay. I'm doing this now. Um, but the, the Triffid thing, I, I would point out that, uh, at least in the book, when he was eight or nine was when they had the, his first encounter with the Triffid. So by the time this apocalypse happened, it was, they were rather commonplace. And I understand the matter of fact, because they were not really viewed as anything but this part of their economy. Yeah, I agree about it's his whole career. I mean, he was the first person in in Britain stung by Triffid. He's been around him his whole life. So his matter of factness about them, I think, does make sense. And also the Triffids in every, uh, well, in, what is it, in the book and in the 2009 movie, for sure, because the Triffid oil stops global warming and people using fossil fuels, the Triffids kind of become normalized in the economy, and it's like, oh, how can we make money off of this? Well, we'll just create some corporations and some Triffid farms. And I feel like like he knows more than the average citizen about Triffids. And by this time, Triffids have just been a part of life in general in the world. So maybe they've had time to kind of 
get over it. They're also not as afraid of the Triffids, though, as he is, because he knows more about them than them. They're kind of like, oh, this is, you know, the Triffids aren't a problem. Everybody's always telling Bill he's crazy for getting Triffid killing equipment. So, yeah, I think there's something, you know, like what Matt's saying. It's his matter of factness, but it's also like, I think Wyndham showing us how people can get so used to something, especially if they're fed a certain message about it, that we don't even see the threats that are already there before the apocalyptic moment happens. The interesting thing about that is that it's a common motif across a lot of his other stuff. Uh, I mean, Midwich Cuckoos, which especially in the original is so grim, uh, you know, you have this unprecedented event that takes place in a tiny little sleepy English village, so people largely forget about it until something very bad happens. And Crock and Wakes is a textbook example of it. I mean, one of my best friends can't stand it for one of the same reasons I'm very fond of it, which is Crock and Wakes is basically a story about the world ending just off stage left. And the, it follows these two journalists through this event that takes five to seven years, and they are directly involved in trying to raise public awareness about this, and no one cares. And it starts off with UFOs crashing into the ocean above every one of the deepest oceanic trenches and finishes with essentially war with a sentient alien race. And in the, in, in the middle, the UK in particular, mostly just kind of grumbles a bit and has a few meetings and pretends it hasn't happened. So that idea of accepting this awful thing or this unprecedented thing and certainly with, with Triffids commoditizing it, is one of the, the concepts that Wyndham seemed to orbit around for most of his career. Yeah, Bill Mason is basically a Monsanto employee. And he's uh, <laughs> This is a, a precursor of GMO frankenfood scares, and it, it part of what helps it age so well. I mean, uh, Triffids were, were nutritious but bland, so they were really good for uh, animal feed or maybe poor people in a pinch. Oh, my God, that kale. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Triffid <The>, chips. <laughs> They're carnivorous ambulatory kale. This makes so much more sense now. <laughs> well, I do remember at the end of the book that they uh, – when – when Bill is approached by the the army sort of people, and they say, "Okay, well, we're we're going to have you look out for a group of, I think it's ten to twenty blind people a piece. I don't remember the exact number, but he said, "Well, I don't have enough food on this farm." And they said, "That's all right. Just mash triffids and feed that to them." And he's aghast because it's it's cattle food, but uh, yeah, apparently just feed the blind people the triffid kale. <laughs> so. Well, That's the solution. Yeah, I mean, there is this kind of corporate distrust and, and government distrust almost that it's not a major point in the book, but it, it seems to be there. Like, even in the beginning, when Bill takes the job with the Arctic and European fish oil company, and then suddenly they just, you know, very quietly drop the word fish from their name, and they're, you know, all about triffid oil at this point. And he talks about how wealthy everyone got. Um, from being in on it early. And, you know, it does kind of have a ring of, of a Monsanto-esque type thing. And I'm wondering if that is something that was in his mind and maybe we'll never know, or if I'm looking at that through through my eyes today. And I'm also wondering if that shows up in the later versions, if, if maybe that's amplified. If I remember correctly, with the, the Eddie is our Jason Priestley casting pulled out of a hat version, um, yeah, that's very, very much more overt. I know uh, there's a there's a very large sequence there at a Triffid farm, and I'm sure GMOs are used as buzzwords throughout. And I have a vague memory, though I'd have to watch it again to confirm this, that instead of his very curious, kind of morally ambiguous approach uh, that we see in the novel, Coca is very much rabidly anti-GMO. And I, I, I think it becomes much more of a factor in, in the later adaptations. Fascinating. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's like the point you made, that there's an awful lot of stuff in this book that, to use the really crass metaphor, given it's about kind of response, there are a lot of seeds that grow over time. <laughs> and turn into something very different and interesting every time you come back to it. Well, I'm curious about, there There were some radio adaptations of this, weren't there? 
I think so, yeah. And it's a really strange thing to do an audio adaptation of because, I mean, the thing which I was always drilled into me when, uh, oh, yeah, here we are. Um, whenever you, you do audio adaptation is under, is that if you find yourself in a situation where this dialogue needs to happen, what's going on? Why is that piano levitating? Oh no, it's being thrown down the corridor towards us. I've actually heard that in a professional production. Then, you know, you're kind of doing something a bit wrong. But no, from what I can tell, it's actually been adapted three times. Once in 1957, which is really interesting because that's almost contemporaneous with publishing. So only six years later. Once in 1968 and once in 2001. And I think the 2001 edition is still available, actually. Because a little while ago, an awful lot of the BBC science fiction audios were put out in two disc sets. And they, they did the first version of Croc and Wakes. They did quite a mass memoirs as well, which is kind of adjacent to all this kind of stuff. So I, I think it's in there too. So let's just see if I can find out. Well, there's a version on Internet Archive. I can't tell which version this is, but the artwork for it suggests at least relatively modern. But yeah, there is, there's what looks like it's either an audio book or a very long adaptation, clocking in about 10 hours on Internet Archive at the moment. So that might be an interesting listen. Yeah, Matt, you'll have to link to that in the episode show notes for our, our listeners. I would think that the Triffids themselves would lend itself to some sort of an audio version just because, and, and maybe this is because the first version I saw was the 1962 one, and it, it's it's hard, it's hard to get pure terror just by seeing a plant, <laughs> 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 and uh, and I, and I think the book does so much better because, as you said, there's so much more going on than just the plants that are now walking around and, and hurting people or killing people, you know, there, there's so much more that's going on in the world and that it almost all seems to have just all happened at the same time. And that's what's caused the downfall of civilization. It's not just this one thing. Oh, well, one of the things that you would have to do is make sure that you've got the the sounds that the Triffid makes, the communication of the, you know, they're tapping against their root. You, you would need to make, to make sure to get that right and make it ominous because... I'm not sure the film quite got that. And the film definitely never told us that that was them communicating with each other. The f- that and the fact that it's them communicating is one of the most terrifying things about the Triffids, is that they've got an organization method that we have no way of interpreting. Exactly. And there's, there's actually there's a really interesting tip off to how it could be done. You could do it like the clickers in The Last of Us which, again, is maybe one of those things that owes a lot of its thematic roots to Day of the Triffids. But the way that the clickers communicate in The Last of Us is completely inhuman and disturbing. And at the same time, you can tell there's a language to it. When I was rereading the book in particular, I was even more kind of creeped out by the Triffids Triffids communication methods, I think, than the first time I read it. Because... As you go through the book, nobody really believes the Triffids are intelligent enough to do any of the things that they're obviously doing. Uh, for example, uh, Triffids hide themselves <laughs> so they can kill people more easily. They, because they need uh, rotting meat, they go and they find places where animals are, like on farms, and they start there before they go after people to kind of get their energy up, I guess. They go to houses and they stand next to the doors and the windows where the people go in and out. And then they communicate with each other with this tattoo that uh, uh, Bill's friend believed was communication. And yet even though Bill's friend is studying this in the laboratory and writing papers about it, et cetera, even though as the world is ending, people say it seems like the Triffids can you know, sense vibrations of sound. It seems like this. Bill is always like, no, no, they're just stupid. You know, like We just have to burn them up. We have to do whatever we have to do to survive. Rather than paying attention to Susan, the little kid, who figures out partway through the book that if we don't make noises and we lure them away with noise, like she comes up with this whole, because she hates Triffids so much, she starts to kind of understand their sentience, maybe, sentience may be too strong of a word, but 
she starts trying to play off of their communication methods and Bill, the biology guy and the expert is just in denial that they could be that smart. Maybe he starts to believe it in the end, but I just thought it was so interesting as part of that, I guess, repression and not wanting to believe that the triffids are a threat. You just don't want to believe that these plants besides being carnivorous and can walk, they can also know things. And it's just part of the horror of them. And as, as you say, it's tied so strongly into the fact into really two things in the book, in the fact that they people keep forgetting about them. I mean, one of the things that freaked me out so much was I, I think around the fifty percent mark, where there's a sequence where they are scavenging through houses, and two people walk into the wrong room and die, because there's one outside the window and it can reach them with the, it can reach them with its sting. And he does such a good job throughout of focusing on these other dramas, on kind of the human drama, on the a very unusual and very kind of mutable gender politics that's going on in there, the disease that briefly shows up, all of that. And then periodically a trivet will show up and kill someone. And like you and the characters are both like, oh, yeah, kind of response. Have to remember that next time. <laughs> well, but that's part of, as you said, the, the horror and the insidious nature of what he does well in the book. Because in the movie version, especially the 1962 one that I, that I guess I'm most familiar with. They explain away the triffids as coming from a meteor, and so they're they're this alien plant, I guess, that's been dumped here. Which wasn't as scary to me as when I realized that the triffids were always here. I guess maybe genetically modified in some sort of way. There was talk of the Russians and and that that whole plot line. But the thing that was so frightening to me. And that almost hints at like an eco horror even is that they were almost lying in wait until everyone went blind with the meteor shower. And then they were like, okay, guys, this is our chance. Let's organize and take over. (laughs) And again, I don't know if that was quite like you said, Mel, if it was really, you know, you could call it sentience or, or a real plan. But that's one of the things that that lent the horror of it is okay, they were just waiting for the right opportunity. And and it's the same way that you were describing, you know, they're waiting by windows or they're waiting by doors to to get an easy victim. And that is maybe where they could play it better in a horror or an audio horror than in visual. Because if you can just get that idea they're in hiding and you don't quite see them. I think when you see them on film, it takes away a little bit of the, the terror of what they are. No, you, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the way that it's done, the way that they are explored as this kind of sporadic terror is really interesting. And it's a really brave thing to have a concept this fundamentally goofy and not explain it. Because it is, I mean, as we've all said, it's an incredibly weird and frankly quite silly concept. <laughs> But we're, by not explaining it, it actually becomes more disturbing. And I, rereading it, I'd forgotten one of my favorite moments, which I think hits on the first couple of pages, where Bill's explaining about the meteor shower. And I forget the exact phrasing, but there is a line which it's very compelling to read as him walking right up to what we've talked about, up to the idea that these things are intelligent, we're waiting for a chance or for an activation signal. And Wyndham just kind of points us for a sentence and a half at the possibility that the comet that causes the meteorite, the Triffid, connected, and that this was a very long-form invasion. And then has Bill kind of, you know, shake his head, be huffy and British, and go, no, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, where where was I? And I I really like that. I really like how he's mapped that very complex knot of human psychology and denial onto the book and giving you something you can hang on to if you want to. And if you don't, and Bill clearly doesn't, there's lots of other stuff to be getting on with. I also, I, I noticed that part, but then by the, I guess midway through the book, what struck me was that if if you agree with Bill that maybe the Triffid and the comment, the Triffids and the comments weren't linked, then what's interesting is how them overrunning the countryside breaking free from the nurseries may not necessarily be sentience so much as just another natural thing. As I, I, What struck me was when he kept going on his return trips to London every year or so and noticing the, the gradual decay until the point where he stopped going when driving his car caused the f- 
facade of a house to collapse because it was so tenuous. It seemed like, oh, well, if they're not sentient, which well, they clearly are capable of at least learning, and and we see that when they start avoiding Susan's traps eventually. But if they're not sentient per se and they weren't organizing directly, well, they're at least – overrunning everything just like every other bit of plant life is. It's the natural decay of things when humans stop existing in in mass. And that's exactly where Wyndham, I think, is so brilliant because, you know, as you said, he'll, he'll slip something in in just a sentence or two, and, and that's one of the things that he did, Matt, with that idea because towards the end of the book, Bill starts noticing that the birds are coming back and that there there's just they notice that there are more birds I guess than there ever were there there's some some sort of sentence along those lines and uh, it is that kind of idea of well you know maybe these triffids are just doing what plants are created to do and what animals are created to do that when human civilization falls apart they start filling in the gaps and taking over because humans are out of their way. Although they did cluster around Bill's fences until they could break in. So there was obviously some <laughs> bit of, there was some sort of organization. And, and I mean, I just like how, how there is no one single answer. We don't know that the, the Triffids and the Comet were linked or if it was satellites that, that misfired or were purposefully fired or, or, or I mean, there's so many different possibilities. And I really like that about the book that it never tells you straight out. Mm -hmm. Here's this, here's this, here's this. It's more up to you to determine because much like Bill, you're sort of thrust into this world and really the how doesn't matter so much as what to do next. And I've, I, I like that. But of course, as humans, we're going to wonder how this happened, but we'll never get a satisfactory answer. Yeah, because if you want to pull the interpretation out that, well, these are basically giant artichoke Manchurian candidates that uh, have been activated by by the comet or a satellite, then it really helps, you know, and they're genetically modified by the Russians. So the, it's this whole Cold War undercurrent, you know, from right at the beginning of, of the Cold War. One of the one of the really fascinating things, considering its proximity to the end of World War II, is how full it was of the hope of the Americans coming to save them. And that was that was really not something that, that I was expecting. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear Al's perspective on, on kind of that, on that view. It's... That that's one of the, the kind of really interesting meta components of the book, because um, there's actually an official sequel to it. Simon Clarke, who is a very very well regarded and justifiably so, for a modern British horror author, wrote the Night of the Triffids, set 25 years after the original novel, and focusing on Bill and Gisela's son. And what happens is he ends up going to America and discovering how things have been dealt with over there and various other species of triffid and gets involved in toppling a totalitarian regime based out of New York. There's an obvious joke there. I'm not making it. <laughs> but that combined with almost the kind of other fictional descendants of, of the book and the way that the Americans are discussed within the book gives you this really interesting view of the subgenre that Wyndham essentially wove from whole cloth with these books, which is the, the idea of cozy catastrophe. The, well, the world's ended, but they're still jam is the best way to describe it. And in that instance, a lot of the time, America is Avalon, it's Camelot. It's the place where people come from to help you when you've fallen over. And from a personal point of view, that's something I absolutely resonate with. I, I grew up on the Isle of Man, which is this very small rock in the middle of the Irish Sea. So culturally, I was kind of half Irish and half English. And the next piece of humanity after Ireland, it's New York. Uh, I, I know, I've been to the edge of the Aran Islands, and there is a signpost that says New York, four and a half thousand miles, that one, pointing out over the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean. So I understand viscerally this I, the kind of mythologization of America that, that, that takes place, and I find it really interesting. And it's one of the most morally ambiguous parts of the story. 
because I, I think I find it very touching in a lot of ways. The idea of, oh, it'll be fine. The Americans will come get us. And they won't. Because this is everything. And the gradual shift from that assumption into just getting on with life is a really interesting one. It's one that, like I say, kind of echoes up and down all the various stories which show something. To them. And I mean, the, the thing which brings it most instantly to mind is actually 28 weeks later. Which, and I, this is a whole other thing. This is a massive sidebar about how that's, in my opinion, that's a better movie than the original. But the fact that 28 weeks later is predicated on the idea that an American Red Relief Force has arrived in the UK, is slowly repatriating people, making sure the rage in fact is uh, either contained or allowed to die of their own. And the way that happens and the way that plays out, how everyone makes every great, every good choice, it still goes very badly really seems to be tied to Wyndham for me. Almost to the extent that they show up and everything goes wrong. And they don't show up and everything still goes wrong, but it goes wrong far slower. And at the end of it, there's still jam. You know? <laughs> and it's, it's one of those concepts for which this whole subset of post-apocalyptic fiction is continuing to engage with, for me. The idea of, you know, what happens when the people from the other side of the ocean come and get us out. And how sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a really, really bad one. And you see it in Survivors as well, which is the other TV show, which I would an awful lot to but which instead of Triffids had a disease that kills 99% of the world's population, follows the 1% who are left and trying to build. And I this this is a kind of I mean, I'm in severe danger of being side here, so I'll keep this real brief. But um Big Finish, the people who do all the Doctor Who forecast audio dramas also do Survivors. So they're up to about six seasons. They're really good. They're unfailingly great as well. And they explore this exact, almost psychological territory. The moment where you realize that the only person who's going to help you is you. And what happens when people realize that different speaks in different times. And I mean, the, the part the book that that puts me very much in mind is that kind of last night that Bill and Gisela have before they go in the apartment that Bill disapproves of because the people have had fun and money which they did not spend on pipes and sweaters. And um, he has that line about, you know, the, the, it's a very grim conversation and they're both kind of turning towards the future. And he goes, no, that's business. Business is tomorrow. And it's almost a wait. It's almost they have this one night, this stupid, affluent apartment to remember the world they were from. And then they go off and start trying to build the world that has to come next. Yeah, that, that was maybe one of my favorite scenes or chapters of the book. Not only because Bill was infuriating <laughs> in, how, <laughs> in how he uh, he dismisses her choice of bedroom. <laughs> but... Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I thought it was a very kind of poignant scene where, where they are, and, and they're very conscious of the fact that they are saying goodbye to the way the world has been and everything that they've known, and they're going to enjoy it while they have it, knowing that tomorrow they have to move on. And, and, and they even, in the morning, there's, there's the whole description of how of what she's wearing, and of course Bill is surprised that I guess she's picked something practical and found a better weapon than what he gave her. <laughs> I guess Bill being Bill at that point, but you know there is the kind of final saying goodbye of of who they were before they move into pure s- survival. I appreciated that because I don't think you get that a lot in today's apocalypse narrative. Because and we've kind of been dancing around it, but you could substitute the triffids for zombies or disease or anything, and and the uh, narrative still holds. Um, even though I like the Triffids because they are so weird and strange and you, you don't hear the killer plant nearly enough. But, you know, I, I did appreciate what what Wyndham was doing, especially in that scene with the let's say goodbye to civilization. I think it's it's worth talking about. You, know, you were just talking about uh, Josella, you know, picking something sensible and Bill was surprised. One of the things that I was really uh, struck by is novel in the 1950s. The, the author made it very clear that 
Gisela was was she consistently showed independent agency and competence, and Bill was the one that always underestimated her. But Wyndham Wyndham showed that very effectively that she was really the most competent one, and it's frankly one of the things that disappointed me the most that didn't make it to the film at all. Yeah, I I agree, and it it has been really interesting to see how that's played out across the various adaptations. The version of Gisela you get in the BBC One edition is pretty much the version you have on the page here. She's very competent and is absolutely nobody's victim. And when the one or two points where she is kind of the token damsel in distress, she actually has very good reasons for it. One of the things I really like in the book, where she has this kind of quintessentially British moment after Bill's rescued her of going, gosh, that really wasn't me. I understand completely why I made the mistake that put me in that situation and I feel bad about it. It won't happen again. And and it, she almost kind of submits this verbal apology to him for a bit for the single lack of competency she sh- shows throughout the novel and then proceeds to be this, you know, kind of Michonne-esque badass for the rest of it. I really <laughs> like. Um, but it it's really interesting how the gender politics in this evolve or don't when you take a look at the various versions of, of uh, Josella. The, the 2009 version actually has a pretty pretty solid version of her. She's recast as a TV news reporter who is in a London underground station when the solar flare happens that blinds everybody. Jolie Richardson. So she's got the same kind of steel to her. And it was really nice to see that come back because, I mean, the line of, of succession across good interesting, capable female uh, leads in, in stories like this is depressingly short, and there are very large gaps in it. And it's nice to see Gisela take her place back next to people like Ellen Ripley and Sarah Connor as someone who can deal with this stuff that she has. There's a couple times in the book where she just rescues herself and goes off on her own adventures, uh, and we're with Bill, and he's like, I must rescue Josella, I must rescue Josella, and she's already gotten away from her kidnapper. She's already gotten to the country and she's countryside, and she's already running a little estate, the people that she found there. I mean, sometimes when I was reading the book, I, w- I wanted a different version that was from her perspective. <laughs> I'm like, I wonder what Josella's doing right now, because she's awesome. Because <laughs> Bill's kind of awful. Brilliantly, the radio adaptation of Croc and Wakes does much the same thing, because that focuses on this on-air talent, Mike, who is is a presenter, and his wife, Phyllis, is a producer and, and writer. And Mike is very kind of tortured. No, we have to report on things properly. And the end of the novel, they, they basically run completely out of luck, and then Phyllis goes, oh, did I mention I'm also a prep? And, and she has this huge cellar of canned goods and preserves hidden underneath their house that she's been quietly building in the background throughout the story. And the end of it is literally Mike going, oh, you're, you're, you're really very good at this, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I was like you, Mel. I just, I really wanted to follow Gisela through the whole thing. And, and I found it very satisfying as a reader when Bill, you know, because he was constantly trying to find her and worrying about her and thinking about her. And then when he does find her, she's like, oh, well, I'll tell you how I escaped. And, you know, she proceeds to tell the story. Um, and I was like you. I was just like, well, I should have just followed her the whole time. <laughs> I'll just throw in, too, and say I was kind of interested in hearing Josella's story more in depth as well. Not that Bill's wasn't interesting, but yeah, like I I kind of wanted to reach into the page and slap him a little because of how dismissive he was. Like, oh, I didn't think that you would be capable of doing this on your own. I was coming to rescue you. And I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh, man, she was quite capable. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I'm not sure you could sell that book in 1951. And, and Wyndham does a, a really nice dance of you know, are are very clearly pointing out that our POV character, this is his perspective and he's wrong. Yeah, it, it would be, it, it's really easy to, to adapt to this in a very tone deaf way where, you know, you have Bill as, as Dirk Chestmeat and, you know, everything he does is right. And, and you're right, there's real nuance to him where you can see his mannerisms and you can see his preconceptions. And you can also see how the world is instantly outstripping us throughout. Yeah, there is sort of a quiet genius um, 
to Wyndham's writing. And, and, I, and I think you're right in that this was the book it had to be for 1951. And, but it, he's very masterful in, in how he still gives you the story, I guess, he wanted to give you while still making it palatable for audiences at the time. Well, and he also kind of hints at the future, I think, too, because Bill's mindset changes slowly, I think, in some ways in the book. But Josella is much more adaptable, looking toward the future, willing to change. And when he gets Susan as like his adopted child, Susan, in some way, I mean, Susan becomes Triffid's lair. Like she hates them. She studies how to kill them. She ends up knowing as much or more about them then Bill, and he's like, how did, at one point we realized she's known all this the whole time and he didn't even notice, like he's been chopping wood or something. He's like, how do you know all this information? And at at the end of the book, he's like, I'm going to teach my son David all about biology and he will save the world. But a savvy reader knows that Susan's kind of already starting that. And I thought it was so interesting to take a girl who starts out at like 10 and ends the book at like, whatever it is, I don't know, 14, 15 or something. And she's adept with all sorts of weapons. She's farming. She, in some ways, they would have died in some ways if she hadn't been there to help Bill. And it's so interesting to see a child character like that, especially a a young girl, morph into that. Oh, absolutely. She's arguably the most, along with Gisela, she's arguably the most important part of the novel. And you're right. She does a really, she's a really good example of this kind of quiet subversion of expectation that Wyndham does for both his characters and for the readers. Susan also makes me wish that we got a lot more zombie traps in films because that is something that is painfully under, underutilized. And I, I love I loved all of her elaborate, you know, uh, Rube Goldberg sort of, you know, tripping traps. I completely agree. I mean, yeah, completely, wholeheartedly. To me, and this is why I have always said to people is that, you know, why I love a good apocalypse story or a good post-apocalypse story, they always ring a bit untrue to me because I thought if something major happens, we're just going to forget about it or we're just going to move on to the next thing. And, you know, the apocalypse is going to be happening and we're not going to know it. Um, That's just the way I've seen people handle anything major that happens. You know, we get shocked and horrified, you know, for as long as we need to. And then we move on to the next thing and we, we stop worrying about it. You can't exist in a state of continuous panic and worry. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you, Alex. Thank, Thank you, you so much enjoy. for having us on. This is the No Fear Podcast. You can find us online at Twitter and Instagram at NoFearCast. That's K-N-O-W FearCast. Or our website, NoFearCast.com. If you want to contact us, send us an email to NoFearCast at gmail.com. Download us through iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere else podcasts are found. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Or you can support us on Patreon. Supporters get special perks such as early access to our main episodes and exclusive mini-episodes released on the weeks in between our normal schedule, depending on the tier you choose. Even a little bit makes a big difference. The No Fear Cast. We know what scares you. This is a personal project and not related to any academic institution.